Hello everyone. Welcome to Skills Build Training YouTube channel. Myself Muhammad Zubair and this channel is all about showing you how to become an IT pro really fast. In today's video, we are going to talk about R programming language for beginners. R is known as the language of the data science. As per the latest survey, it was found out that R is used more than 50% than Python. That was really surprising for me too. Because we know data scientist loves to use Python. In recent developments, R has taken over Python as well. The reason behind why R is being used more than any other programming language is that first of all, it's open source. Secondly, the use of the for loops is very minimal. It means that it is easier for you in R programming language to go to any data values in your data sets. And because of that, R took a lot of load from the programmer and provided them with an easy to use and understandable solution. Thirdly, R has a lot of packages out there which are free to use. As per latest data, R has more than 9000 packages which are free to use. And last, R has a very large community support available. If you ever get into trouble, you always got the support from the community. Now, let's talk about the installation of R. To download and install the R in your system, just go to the link which is being provided to you in the description. So I'll paste that link in my browser and I'll hit enter. So from here, click this link which says download R 4.0.54 windows. So I'll just click on it. And after that, your file will get start to download. So in my case, I have already downloaded it. So now I will just go to my directory to install it. So when you are done with your downloading, just go to the directory where you have saved your file. Now, from here, we have to run that file as an administrator. And for that purpose, right click on it and then click on run as administrator. After that, the installation process will get started. So here it is asking for the language. So I'll go with English. Then just click on next. This is the directory where your R will be installed in your system. So in case if you want to change the directory, you can always do that from browse button. But the preferable one is the default one, which is in C drive. So from here, click on next again, next. And from here, you should go with acceptable defaults and click on next again, next. And yes, you want to have a desktop shortcut. So for that purpose, check this box and then click on next. Now the installation process has started. So it might take one or two minutes to get it completed. So here you can see that we are almost done with our installation. Now it's time to download the IDE for R programming language. For R programming language, R Studio is the one which is used as IDE. So to download it, go to the second link which is being provided to you in the description of this video. Just copy that link and paste in your favorite browser and hit enter. After that, you will get to a page something like this. If you scroll down here, here you have four different files or four different version. First one is for desktop. Second one is desktop pro. Then you have server, then you have server pro. So as we are the beginners, we are only concerned with our studio desktop free version. So we will just click on it from here. Just click here and your download process will get started. So after you are done with the downloading of our studio, just head to your directory where you have downloaded your file from here. Again, we have to run that file as an administrator for that purpose, right click on it and click on run as administrator, click on next. And this is the directory where our, our studio will be installed. If you want to change that directory, you can always do that. But the default one is a preferable one. So from here, click on next again, next. And now it has started to install the process of our studio. So here you can see that we are almost done with the installation. So now 
It is completed. Just click on finish. And we are done with the download and installation of both R and R Studio. Now it's time to get our hand dirty with R Studio and R language. To open R Studio, just write R Studio in the search area of your Windows. I'm going to write here R and now it is showing me the R Studio. Again, we have to run that as an administrator. So right click on it and then click on run as administrator. So now our R Studio has been opened and it is loading. And this is the first look of our studio so here is our console here is the window from where we can download different packages as i have told you in the start of the video that r has more than 9000 packages available in it so we can download any package from here and if you are working on graphs plots or any data which has link with plots or graph you can always work on that here this is your area where you will be coding so we will get here in detail in a little while so let's get started with the concepts related to programming in r so i'll start with the variables if we talk about the variables it is a memory location in the, your system's memory where you store a value so when we declare a variable it identifies the data type of the variable and decides that where it belongs in the memory. So in simple words, it is a value which we store in a particular memory location in our system using variable. Now let's talk about some of the data types here first. As you might have experienced any programming language, so it will be easier for you to understand variables in our programming language too. So first of all, I'm going to declare x equals 100 then I'm going with y equals string high then I'm going with z equals true and at the end I'm going with a equals 3.14 so you might know what the data types of these variable will be so first one is of integer type second one is string type third one is boolean type and fourth one is float type but in our language we have five data types first one is vector then we have matrix then we have arrays then list and at the end we have data frames i'll start with the vector here vector is the simplest type of data in which we have sequence of data elements which belongs to the same data types in vector we have further five classes and they are also known as basic atomic types and these are logical in logical we have two values either it will be true or false either it will be one or zero then we have integer in integer we have integer numbers then we have numeric in numeric we can have any type of number it can be decimal point number it can be a simple number and it can be anything but it should be a number then we have complex in complex we have mixed type of data then we have character in character we can have a string of character or a single character as well so now let's have some examples of all these classes of vector first of all i'm going to explain the logical or boolean class here for that purpose i'll take a variable i'm going to name it as x then i will use less than and dash here i'm going to give it a value and that value i'm going to give is true now i want to run this line of code for that purpose just select this line of code and then click on run button so here you can see that it is showing me the output x equals true so here is the environment where you get the data which has been stored in your variable so as you know that i have stored the true in my x variable so it is showing me the value here now i want to check that x belongs to which class so for that purpose i'll just have to write class and i have to pass the variable name which is x and now if i run these two line of code and click on run here and here you can see that it says logical means our x belongs to the logical class of vector so i hope now it is clear to you that 
how boolean or logical classes of vector work now let's head to our next class of vector which is numeric okay let me tell you one thing here that if you want to add comments in your r studio or in your r programming language you just have to add hash and start typing your comment i'm writing here numeric and now i will declare a variable which will be of numeric class so for that so i'm going to name it as y less than sign dash 10.5 if i run this line of code here you can see that y has the value of 10.5 now let's check the class of our y so for that purpose we will write class open bracket we will pass the variable and then we will hit run button so here you can see that it says numeric so our y belongs to the numerical class so let's head to our next class which is integer i'll write comment here first and then I'll write my code. So now I'm going to take a variable named as a, and I'm going to pass the value as 1000. But here is a trick in our programming language. And that is when you declare an integer value, you have to put a capital L in front of it. If you do not put the capital L in front of it, your program will take that value as numeric class. So to be specific, with integer class you have to put a capital l in front of it for example if i remove the l and if i check the class of it so let's see what output we get so let me select these two lines and click on run so here you can see that it says numeric again now i want it to be an integer class for that purpose i'll press shift l and now select these two lines and run this and now here you can see that it says integer so i hope it will be clear to you now whenever you want to have an integer type of class you must use capital l in front of your value now let's move on and discuss our next type of class first of all let me remove all of this code from here and let's remove everything from the console as well to clear the console just go to your edit and from here click on clear console so now we will talk about the complex class of our vectors. So I'm going to name my variable as x and I'm going to pass the value as 9i plus 3. So I have mixture of values like I have integer and I also have character. So this type of data gets handled in complex class of our vector. So you might have noticed that in your mathematics subject, you might have faced these type of equation. So now let's check the class of this for that purpose, just pass the variable to the class function and run your code. So here it says complex. So we are left with only one type of class of vector, which is character or string. So now let's take a variable and name it as str. And I'm going to store in it a value r is interesting. And now let's check the class of this variable select these two line and hit run so here it says character one thing is very interesting and very helpful in r and that is you do not have to worry about the double or single inverted commas you can use single commas or you can use double commas as well so i'm going to change it from double to single and now if i run this code again it says character so in character you can have single character or you can have string of character as well let's pass more than one value to our variable i'm going to name it as var equal c and in there i'm going to pass my values and my values will be true which you know that it is a boolean type and then i'm going to pass my integer which is 35 and you might remember that when we store in an integer value we have to press capital l as well and at last i'm going to pass a numeric value now let's check the class of our variable if i select this line of code and hit run and here you can see that it says numeric so by default it has taken everything as numeric even though we passed boolean and integer values as well let's have another variable as variable 2 equal c and now i'm going to pass the values my first value will be of character type my second value will be same as the previous variable 23.3 and now if we check the class of this variable so select these line of codes and click run 
Here you can see that it has taken the class as corrector. So whenever you pass a string with other data types, our programming language will take all of them as corrector. So this was all about vectors and their classes in our programming language. Now let's talk about some of the math functions in our programming language. Math operations are same in our programming language, just like any other programming language. For example, if I write here five plus 10, run this line of code. So here you can see that it says 15. And now if I store this in some variable, let's say I have a variable name as add and I say five plus 10. And now if I run this line of code, here it says 15. So I have variable name add and I've stored five plus 10. So answer is 15. Let's check the other math functions as well. Subtract for that purpose, I'm going to minus five from 10 and select this line of code. And after that, click on run. And here it says five because we know that five out of 10 is five. So same goes with multiplication and division. The only difference in our programming language from other programming language is that it has different way of handling modulus. In other programming language, we just use one percentage sign, but in R, we have to use double percentage sign. So for example, if I name it as modulus, and if I run this line of code, it should be zero answer. So here you can see that modulus is equal to zero because we knew that modulus of 10 from five is zero. So this is the only difference in regards of math function in our programming language with other programming languages. So this was all about math functions. Now let's head to our next topic, which is strings in our programming language. In R, we can store the string in single and double quotes as well, just like I have explained earlier. So I'm going to name my variable as str and I'm going to store a value as high. So if I run this line of code, here it says str has the value which is high. So now I'm going to write multiple line of character or you can say string. So I'm going to write here, hello, welcome to skills build. And I'm going to write here comma and hit enter. Now we are in our next line. Here I'm going to write this channel is all about latest videos. Again, I'm going to hit enter so that I can have my next line. And here I will write, hope to see you again. And remember in last line, you have to have your closing inverted commas, just like I have. So if I select these line of code and if, if I click on run, so here you can see that I have multiple line of characters here, or you can say I have multiple line of strings here. Now, what if I want to have the length of my string? For that purpose, we have an inbuilt function in our programming language, and it is known as an char, which is the abbreviation of n character. So for that purpose, I'll take a variable as calc and I'm going to store in here a value or a string, which is hello world. So now I'm going to pass this variable to a function, which is n char. And in here, I'm going to pass my variable name. And if I select this line of code, click on run. And here you can see that it says 11. So if you count these numbers, it will be equal to 11. Now let's talk about the next function of string, which is GREPL or grepl. What it does, it checks if a character or a sequence of character is present in a string or not. So now I have taken a variable named as str and in that I have stored a value, hello world. So down here, I have called my function, which is GREPL. And in that we have to pass two values. The first value is the value which you want to check in your string. And second value is the name of the variable in which you have stored your string. So obviously I have stored my this string in my str variable. So now I have taken two other scenarios as well. Second scenario says 
check if world is present or not and third scenario says check if capital x is present or not now i will select all these lines of code and hit on a run button and here it says true true false so now as you can see that h is present world is present but we do not have the x present in our hello world string so let's check if it is case sensitive or not for that purpose i'll just write small h now if i run these line of code here it says false to false so yes it is case sensitive so you should be searching for the exact type of data with exact type of case sensitivity now what if we want to merge two strings for that purpose we have a function named as paste so let's have a variable str1 so in that i'm going to store skills build and in my second variable which is str2 in that i'm going to store a value which will be training youtube channel and now i want to merge these two string together for that purpose i just have to use the paste function and in that i have to pass the variable name or pass the string name which i want to concatenate or merge together so obviously we have str1 and we have str2 so just select these line of code hit on run so here you can see that it says skills build training youtube channel so by mistake i put this here i will remove this and now if i run this again so here it says skills build training youtube channel so i hope that this was very easy to understand now what if we want to add something in inverted commas in a string because in most of the programming language this is a very problematic situation because when we declare a string we use inverted commas and in that string when we use again the inverted commas it gets errored in the program so in our programming language we solve this problem by escape character so let me declare a string first here i'll name it as str and in that i will pass the value as we are from skills build family and now as you can see that this is a string type what if i want to have my skills build in my inverted commas so i will just hit inverted commas in front and at the end of skills build but as you can see that if i run this line of code it is showing me the error which says unexpected symbol in str we are from skills so why is that that it has taken we are from as one string and family as a one string and it has skipped this skills build to cope up with this type of problem we use escape character which is a forward slash so here you can see that it has turned into a green color and now if i run this line of code here you can see that it says we are from skills build family so now as you can see that it has not shown any error but it is showing me these forward slashes so for that purpose we will use a function name as cat and in that we will pass our variable name so now if i select these line of code and click on run so here you can see that it says we are from skills build family with inverted commas inside my string so this is how easy it is to cop up with inverted commas problem in a string in our programming language so that was all about the strings now let's head to our next topic which is comparison operators when we say comparison operator in comparison obviously we check if they are greater or if they are less than or if they are equal so we will check these type of function so the functions in comparison operators are equals then we have not equal then we have greater then we have less than and less than equal and at last we have greater than and equal so we will see each of them one by one so let's start with equals so what if i write here 5 equals equals 5 and down here if i write 5 equals equals 3 so if i select these line of code and if i run this so what it says it says true and false so obviously 5 is equal to 5 so that's why it says true 
and in second line 5 is not equal to 3 that is why it says false one thing is which needs to be remembered here that equals function only works when we use double equal because if you use single equal it is an assignment operator means you are assigning a value of 5 to 5 but if i hit double equal what it will do it will compare these two five or these two values which are on left hand side and right hand side so you should be careful with that now let's check our next operator which is not equal to so i will write here 10 is not equal to 5 let me copy this and i'll paste it here and here i will say 10 is not equal to 10 if i select these line of code hit run and here it says true and false obviously first line is true and second one is false because 10 is not equal to 5 obviously that is true but in second line it says 10 is not equal to 10 which is false that's why it says false so this was all about not equal to function now let's talk about greater than and less than i will write here 5 is less than 5 and next line i will write 5 is greater than 10 so if i select these line of code and i hit run both are false because we know that 5 is not less than 5 and 5 is not less than 10 that is why it says false so we are left with greater than and equal to and less than and equal to for example if i write here 10 is greater than equals to 11 and down here if i write here 10 is less than equal to 15 and if i select these line of code hit run and it says false and true because obviously we know that 10 is not greater than or equal to 11 and we know 10 is less than 15 so that is why it says true what if i change here value from 11 to 10 it will be a true value and here you can see that it says true because here we check two condition first condition is greater than and second condition is equal to so it will check if it is greater than or even if it equals then it will return a true value so that was all about the comparison operator now let's talk about the conditional statements in our programming language in conditional statements we check a condition and we ask the program to perform according to it for example take a variable as a and i store a value of 30 in it and i'm going to take another variable and i'm going to store 100 in it so now i'm going to put a condition here my condition will be if b is greater than a then print b is greater than a now if i select this code and run this code here it says b is greater than a so let's go through our code here so i have two variable here one has value of 30 and second one has 100 further down i have a condition which checks if b is greater than a means if 100 is greater than 30 then print a string and string says b is greater than a this is how conditional statement works now let's talk about if else means we will have a condition in which we have else statement as well let me clear my code here let me clear my console here and now i will write a code so i will take a variable and give it value of 30 and in second variable which is b i will give the value of 30 as well now i will have my if condition and in that i will check if a is greater than b and if that is the case i want to print a is greater than b and after that i want to have an other check and that will be else if in that i will have an other condition and that will be else if a equal equal b and if that is the case i want to print something and that will be print both are equal and now before running this program let's go through our logic here so that we can have an idea that what type of output we are going to get so we have two variables both have same value so in first condition we are checking if a is greater than b now that will be a false because both have same value so our program will ignore this line and it will go to the next statement which is else if a equals equal b now let's see if both are equal or not 
yes both are equal because both have same value so now our program will print this statement so let's select all these line of code and run our program and here you can see that it says both are equal so now let's check nested if statements in nested if statement we have more than one if statements and we have if statement within an if statement and one thing to be remembered here and that is every time you use an if statement you should always use else block with it as well because it is considered as a good programming practice that whenever you use an if statement or if block you always use else statement or else block with it as well so let's have a variable as x and i'm going to give it value of 50 and after that i will have an if statement which says if x is greater than 20 what i want i want to print a value which says print above 20 after that i want to have another if statement so I will check another condition which checks if x is greater than 30 opening and closing curly brackets and after that I will print above 32. Now as I told you earlier that when we use if statement we should also use the else statement as well. So now I will use the else statement here. My else statement will be else print but not above 30. So now we are done with this if and its else. As you can see that these two are in same structure. Now we are left with this if and we have to put its else here. So for that purpose we will come out from this else block and here we will have our else statement and that will be print. My string will come here and that will say below 20. And now if I select all these statement and if I run my program here, so here you can see that it says above 20 and in second line, it says above 32. So let's go through our program and its logic here. We had a variable named as X and we initiated it with the value of 50. Then we had a condition which checked if X is greater than 20, then it should print above 20. Yes, our x is greater than 20 as it has 50 stored in it. That's why it has printed above 20. After that, in second condition, it checked if x is greater than 20, then it should print above 32. Yes, this condition is also true. So that's why it printed above 32. Now let's manipulate our program here. I'm going to give it a value of 10 and now if I run this program, here you can see that it says below 20. Why? If we come here, first condition says x is greater than 20, which is false as x has value of 10. Then in second condition, it is also false. So what it will do, it will not execute the inner if because if condition got false, that's why inner if else statement will be get ignored. But when it will come to the else statement, which is by default, as the statement says below 20, it will print below 20. Now, let me make a simple change here. I want to have a different condition here, which says x is greater than 30. Now, if I run here, and here you can see that it has the same answer, which says below 20. Because in both of the condition, x has less value than 20 and 30. So that is why we will get the answer of below 20. So I hope now you have an idea that how nested if works. Now let's talk about the comparison operator in our programming language. For that purpose, I will take three variables and I will store different values in it. I will take a and I will take b. In b, I will store 100 and in my last variable, I will name it as C and in that I will store a value of 500. After that, I will have an if statement which will say if A is greater than B and C is greater than A, what it should do, it should print a statement like both condition are true. And now if I run my program, so here it says both conditions are true. Now let's go through our program here. We have two statements. First one says if A is greater than B, let's check if A is greater than B. Yes, A is 200 and B is 100. 
and let's see if the second condition is true or not which says c is greater than a yes c is greater than a as c has 500 and a has 200 so our both these conditions are true and we know that in and statement our program will only work if both conditions are true now let me make a small change in my program and if i say c is less than a and we know that this is not true our program should have an error for that purpose i will print a message press ctrl plus enter so here it says error because my one condition is false and other one is true but in and statement as we know that we should have both condition as true so that was all about if as statement in our programming language now let's talk about the loops in our programming language first of all we will talk about the while loops so let me have a variable and i will name it as i and i will give it a value of one so now i will write my while block in that i will write while i is less than five what it should do it should keep printing value of i and after that I will increment my i as i i plus one if i run this program here here you can see that it has printed one two three four now let's go through our program logic here what we did here we initiated our i with a value of one and then we said while i is less than five what it should do it should print the value of i so in first iteration i has the value of one which is the true condition as one is less than five what it did it printed the value of i which was one and after that it incremented in i with plus one so now after the incrementation value of i became two again it went up Again, it checked the condition if i is less than 5. Yes, 2 is less than 5. So again, it printed the value of i, which was 2. Again, it incremented in i, which was 2 initially. And then after the incrementation, it became 3. Again, it went on and on and on. And after printing it 4, it was incremented and it became 5. And then it checked if 5 is less than 5. No, 5 is not a less than 5. At that moment, or while loop got stopped and we had four values which are one two three and four so this is how while loop worked. and now let's talk about a break statement in a while loop so what i did here i just added an if statement which says i equal equal four then break means when our while loop will get start it will keep on iterating and keep on printing the values as soon as it gets to four what it will do it will stop the program right there we had value of i as 4 and then it came down and here it checked if i is equal equal 4 and yes 4 became equal to 4 so condition got true and after that it stopped the program right here i'm going to select all these lines and i'm going to run my program so here you can see that it says 1 2 3 but we know that our while loop should have printed values up to five but because of break statement it has stopped the while loop from printing further values after three so this is how break statement work let's talk about if else statement with while loop i will take a variable named as dice and in that i will initiate it with value of one and after that i will start my while loop and in my while loop i will say dice less than equals six i'm writing here that if dice less than six what it should do it should print something which says lose and in its else statement it should print which says one now i will come out of my else block and down here i will write here dice and i will increment the value of one in dice every time my while loop works so now if i run this program so here you can see that it has printed lose five times and then on the sixth time it has printed one so what it did was it started with an initial value which was one and it checked if dice is less than six obviously a value of dice initially was one so that's why it printed lose then 
from here it became 2 but 2 is also less than 6 so it again printed the lose then it keep on going and going after the incrementation it became the 6 here it checked if 6 is less than 6 no this condition is not true so that is why our program did not execute this line instead it executed this line and said 1 that is why we have 5 value as lose and 6th one as a 1. So this is how if else work with while loop. So that was all about while loop. Now let's talk about the other type of loop which is for loop. I will start my for statement which says for. In here I will take a variable and I will say it as in 1 to 10. Now what it will do it will take a value of x from 1 to 10 means x has now 10 values and after that I will print the value of x. If I select my line of code and then if I run this program here you can see that it has printed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 up to 10. Now let's have another example. In that example I'm going to take a variable named as fruits and in that I'm going to store some values. My values will be apple, mango and last one will be cherry and now I want to print these through. For that purpose, I will use a for loop. What it should do, it should print the value of x. If I select all these lines and run my program, here you can see that it says apple, mango, and cherry. So what it did basically that we had a list here. I have two ways to print it. First one was that I could have print individually or I could have used a for loop. So the for loop one was a better one because I do not have to repeat my code again and again. What I did basically here, I initiated a variable which names fruits and in that I had three values. After that, I have my for loop and I said for x in my fruits. So what it had, it had all the values present in fruits in its x variable. After that, I said to my program, that print the x value. So at first time it had the value of apple, after that it had mango, then it had cherry. One by one my program printed all the value which were present in my fruits variable. Now let's talk about the nested for loops. Nested for loop means that we will have more than one for loop in a one program. For that purpose, let me clear my console and I will remove all this code. And now I'm going to have a variable named as color. And in that I will have different colors. For example, I will have a red. I will have black. I will have blue. And in my second variable, I will have my cards. And I will again take a list. And in that list, I will have different cards model. For example, I will have BMW, then I will have Audi, and then at the end, I will have Ferrari. Now, let's start our for loop. So I will say for X in color, what it should do, it should take an other for loop for Y in card. So what it should do after that, it should print a statement, which is print paste x and y if you remember that when we were talking about string i told you about paste function which merge two strings together so now let's talk about the logic here what my program will do in my first for loop it will check the colors so in my colors we have three values which are red black and blue so first time my first for loop will run after the first iteration of my first for loop it will print all the values present in cars so first time it will print red with bmw then red with audi then red with ferrari once it done with all the inner values of for loop which is this one it will increment in this one and x will become black and now it will print black bmw black audi and black Ferrari and then it will again get incremented and this time it will print blue with BMW, blue Audi, blue Ferrari. Okay, let me select my all the programming lines and then if I run this, here you can see that it says 
रेड बी एम डब्ल्यू रेड ऑडी रेड फेरारी ब्लैक बी एम डब्ल्यू ब्लैक ऑडी ब्लैक फेरारी एंड अप टू सो ऑन दिस इज एग्जैक्टली वॉट आई टोल्ड यू दैट हाउ माई nested for loop will work in my first for loop it had the value of red and in my second for loop it keep on changing the values of car's model which was bmw audi and ferrari then it was done with this and it incremented in this for loop then it started to print with the black one and after that it started to work with blue this is how nested loop work in our programming language so that was all about for loop in our programming language now let's talk about function in r a function is a block of code which only runs when it is called you can pass data known as parameters into a function a function can return data as a result so let's make a function here and name it as my function and let's initiate our function now its brackets and after that print something in it hello world now if i run this program here so here you can see that it has printed nothing because we have just declared our function we have not called it anywhere so let's call my function and print what is present in it so i will write here my function now just select this line of code and run this code so here you can see that it has printed hello world so this is how function works now let's pass a parameter in our function so here is our function and let's pass a parameter here and i say f name now instead of printing something here i will paste something and that will be f name and a static value that value will be james so now when i have called my function and in that if i pass my value as peter and now if i run my program so here you can see that it says peter james so what it did basically in our function it took a variable or a parameter in our paste statement it can concatenated it with a james value which was static and which was given by us now when we called our function which is my function here and in that i have passed a value of peter and that peter will go here in f name and our program will check that where i should transfer this value so here you can see that it has written here so from here our value will get transferred here and now when we will run this program it will concatenate these two values and it will print it let me copy this line or this function and paste it two three more time let's change the values i will write here joe i will write here clark and i will write here lee now if i run this program here you can see that it says peter james joey james clark james and lee james this is how you can pass a parameter to a function now let's try to pass two parameters so that you can have better understanding about this concept so now let me remove these lines and let me pass an other parameter here which says l name means last name so now instead of james i will write here l name and now if i call my function here and i have to pass two parameters now earlier i was passing just one parameter so i will pass first name as brett and second parameter as johnson so now if i select all these line and i run my program here you can see that it says brett johnson so this is how you can pass two parameter in a function we can pass any number of parameter in our function so let's pass another parameter here so i will name it as m name which means middle name so i have to give another name here when i am calling my function i will pass the value as john if i run my program it is again giving me the brett johnson so what is the problem here okay yes in my paste i didn't have passed my middle name parameter so i will pass it here as well and now if i run my program here you can see that it says brett john johnson this is how you pass parameters in your function now let's see 
how we can take return values from our function. So let me make my function here. I will name it as my function. And in here, I will pass a parameter, which will be X. Now I will initiate. And now in that, I will pass a parameter, which will be X. And after that, I will start my function. So as we are returning some values from the function, so we will use keyword, which says return. And in that, we will have a number which will be multiplicated with five. So as you remember, or as you can see that we passed a parameter as X, so we will pass it here as well. So now we are good and we are done with our function. Now it's time to call our function. So for that purpose, I will write print. And in that print statement, I will call my function. And that is my function. And in that I have to pass the values for that parameter, which we have used here. So let's say I'm going to give it a five. And now I'm going to copy this line and I will paste it two, three times more. And I will change the values six, eight, and two. Now, if I run my program here, you can see that it has printed 25, 30, 40, and 10. So what it did basically, it has multiplicated this five with this five in next statement, this five with six, then with eight, then with two. So as we have called our function four times, that is why it has given the output four times. So that was all about the functions in our programming language. As we are here in our function, let's talk about the global variables as well. So let me clear this one. And here I will write paste r is and after that I will pass a variable name. So you might be wondering that where is that variable we do not have declared yet. So let me declare a variable here and I will declare it as txt and I will name it as great. I have to call my function first. That is my function. So now if I run my program here, you can see that it says r is great. So what it did basically it has used the variable which was declared outside the function. So this is how global variable works. Now let's make small changes in our program and I'm going to name it as global variable. And in my function, I'm going to have another variable, same name as txt, and I'm going to initiate it with fantastic. And now if I paste here and I will cut this line and if I paste it here, so what it will do now, so let's run this program. It says R is fantastic. What it did here, basically it has taken the txt variable, which is being declared inside the function. So that is why it has shown the value as fantastic. But if I call my txt here, and if I run this here, you can see that it says global variable because this txt will be this one. And in here it has taken the txt, which was declared inside the function. And when I called this function here, it printed the value which was declared inside this function. So this is how global and local variable works in our programming language. So let's move on to the last topic of today's video. And that is list. A list in R can contain many different data types inside it. A list is a collection of data, which is ordered and changeable to create a list, use a list function. And that is something like this. So we will see how it works. So let's say I have my list and I name it as my list and I will initiate my list. And in that list, I will have different things. For example, I have apple, I have mango, and at last I have orange. So now if I print my list here and if I run my program, here you can see that it has printed apple, mango, and oranges. Now, what if I want to print a particular number or particular index or a particular value from my list? For that purpose, I'll just have to pass the number of index. For example, I want to print which is present at index one. So I will just pass one. And if I run this program now, here you can see that it has just printed the apple. Now let's change the value to three. It should print the orange now. If I run this program, as you can see that it has printed orange here. Now let's try to change the value here. For example, I want to change the value from apple to cherry. For that purpose, 
I will write it index name and then I will change the value as cherry. So now I will call my list here. And now if I run my program here, here you can see that it has changed the value from apple to cherry. We have another function for list and that is length. What if we want to calculate the length of our list? For that purpose, we have to do a simple thing. And that is, let me remove this one. This one also, we have to use a keyword length. And in that, we will have to pass the name of our list. And in our case, that is my list. And now if I run this program, here you can see that it says three. So obviously we have three values in our list and it has given me the same answer. What if we want to check a value or a number or a string is present in our list or not. So we will just have to write the value which we want to check in our list. In my case, I want to check if Apple is present here or not. For that purpose, I will write Apple after that percentage in percentage and now I will write the name of my list. So now if I run this program, here you can see that it says true because Apple is present in my list. Let's change the value from apple to cherry. And now if you run this program, it should show me the false value. And here it is, it is giving me the false. Let's add an item into the list. For that purpose, I will remove this line and I will use a keyword which says append. And after that, I will pass the name of list in which I want to add the value. And after that, I will add the value which I want to add actually. I want to add cherry. If I run this program, here you can see that I have four values now. Now let's have a range of list. Means I want to print only a range or only a certain values from my list. For that purpose, let me remove this line here first. And after that, I will add some more values into my list. Let's add cherry here. Then let's add melon. And let's add watermelon. Now I want to print a range from my list. For that purpose, I will write my list and I will give the range which I want to print on my program. So let's say we want to print from two to five. So now if I run this program, here you can see that it has printed mango, orange, cherry, and melon. So it is two, three, four, five. So this is the exact range which I wanted to print on my program. So as we are done with the basic concepts of R programming language, and if you remember, we talked about R programming language as a data science language. So how is it possible that we talk about R programming language and we do not have an example of data sciences? So let's have an example of data science algorithm. For this video, I'm going to implement the a priori algorithm in R language. A priori is an algorithm which is used to find out the patterns in the data. If you talk about in detail, a priori algorithm is an algorithm for finding frequent item sets in a data set for Boolean association rule. Name of the algorithm is a priori because it uses prior knowledge of frequent item set properties. First of all, we will load a package which will provide the infrastructure for representing, manipulating, and analyzing transaction data and pattern. And the package name is A rules. So to include the package in our program, I will write here library as it's a keyword. So we will just hit enter. And in here, we will write the name of the package. So first package is A rules. Here it is. Okay, one thing to be remembered here, we can only include these packages in our program if we have these packages available in R. As you can see here that we have a lot of packages available, but in case if we do not have the package available, which we want to use, as I have used A rules here, but it was not available in my packages repository by default. So I have downloaded it and I have added it in my repository. So how you can download and install these packages in your repository? There are two ways. First one is you can click on this button which says install. Just click on it and after that write the name of package you want to download and include in your repository. So I will write here A rules. And here it is, just enter it. And now from here, just click on install. And now, as you can see that it says, do you want to restart R prior to install? 
because I have already downloaded and included it in my repository. That's why it is showing me this message. In your case, it will not show you this message. So I will just click on yes, just to show you how it works. And now here you can see that it has started the process of downloading. And after that, it will include this package in my repository on its own. And here you can see that it says package A rule successfully unpacked and MDS sum checked. And after that, it has downloaded this package and it has included this in my repository. The other way to include or you can say download a package is you can do it from your console and to do this we just have to write install dot packages and after that we have to give the name of the package we want to download so as i have shown you that how we can do it from using these button now i will write the name of this package which is a rules and after that i just have to hit enter and now it has started the process and after completing that process it will include this package into my packages repository now i have a rules available here and now i can use this in my program as well so as i have told you earlier that this package will help me in representing manipulating and analyzing transaction data and patterns after that we will load another package which is named as a rules OS. It is used for visualizing association rules and frequent item sets. It extends the packages A rules with various visualization techniques for association rules and item set. The package also includes several interactive visualization for rule exploration. So now I will include my other package, which is library. I will write the name of the package, which is a rules. And here it is, just hit enter. And now we have included our two packages. After that, we will add an other package, which is our color brewer. And this provides color scheme for maps and other graphics. When we will be plotting our graphs or we will have our data in graphs, we will have it in different colors. So for that purpose, we will include our color brewer. And for that purpose, again, I just have to write here library. And here it is, just hit enter. And in here, I will write the name of the package, which is R color. And here it says R color brewer. So I will just hit enter. Now we are done with including our packages. So let me remind you again that you can only include these two packages if only if you have these included in your repository. As you can see that I have a role with here and I also have R color brewer as well. So first of all, you have to download and include these packages in your packages repository. And after that, you will be able to include them in your program. Otherwise, your program will show some error. It's time to import our data in our program. For that purpose, I will write here data and in it, I will include the name of that data set. In my case is groceries. And now, Question arises that from where this data has come. This data is by default is included in these packages, which we have just included in our program, which are A rules and A rules with. This data set come with these two packages. And now we will apply our A priori rule here. A priori function is an inbuilt in R to mine the frequent item sets and association rules using the a priori algorithm. So this is our a priori rule. Let me go through it piece by piece. A priori function is an inbuilt in R to mine the frequent item set and association rules using the a priori algorithm. Here, as you can see that groceries is the transaction data. Parameter is a named list that specifies the minimum support and confidence for finding the association rule. The default behavior is to mine the rules with minimum support of 0.2 and 0.8 as the minimum confidence. Here we have specified the minimum support to be 0.01 and confidence to be 0.2. So I'm going with these parameters. You can change these parameters as per your own requirement or as per your own need. So those who have worked on a priori algorithm or have little bit of knowledge about machine learning and its algorithm, they must know about confidence and minimum support. And now we will apply the inspect function. Inspect function will print the internal representation of an R object 
for the result of an expression and I will display the first 15 strong association rules which will be available in my data set. So I will write the code for my inspect and that is inspect and in here I will have my rules and that is rules and in here I will give the parameter and I want to print it from 1 to 15. So we are done with our inspect function. Now it's time to apply our final step which is to apply item frequency plot function. So for that purpose I will write here a rules and after that I will have my item frequency plot and in here I will give my data set name which is groceries and after that I will have top n equals 20. So what does this mean by top n is equal to 20? I will talk about it later after I complete my code. So now I am done with writing my code here and if you see here we have a rules item frequency plot groceries grocery is the name of the data set which we have used in our program and then it says top n equals 20 mean it will take the top 20 transaction or those 20 transaction which will have the maximum number of support and maximum confidence after that we have our column then we have our main then we have type then we have ylab and these are different parameters which we will use for our plot. After I run my program, you will see these parameters in our output as well. So I will just select all these line of code and after that I will just run my code. And if I go in my plots and here you can see that we have top 20 transactions here. If we count here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So as we selected top and 20, so these are our top 20 transactions which are with highest number of confidence and support. And here you can see that this is the name of our graph which says relative item frequency plot and here it is relative item frequency plot and here it says item frequency and here it is item frequency you can change it as well and you can name it as per your own liking or as per your own need and if you remember when we were inspecting our code i selected this inspect rule 1 to 15 so if i just select this line of code and i run my code and here you can see that it has displayed me the 15 association rules from my data set and this is the confidence and this is the support and this is the coverage and we have lift and we have total number of counts in the data set of this transaction. So you can change this value as well. Let's change this to 10. And now if I select this line of code and after that if I run my program and now you can see that it has shown me the only 10 transaction from my data set. Now at last let's do one more thing and I want to have a plot graph for my data. For that purpose I will just write here plot and in here I will pass the rule of which I want to have the graph. So for now I want to have the plot for this rule. So I will pass in here rules. So now if I select this line of code and if I run this and here you can see that it has shown me the scatter plot for about 232 rules. So this is the confidence for each transaction and this is the support for each transaction. So from here we can see that we have maximum of 0.6 to 7 in terms of support and we have 0.6 to 7 in terms of confidence as well. So this is how easy it is to apply and implement different algorithms and different concepts of data sciences in our programming language. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. In this video we talked about R programming language and we had some example of different concepts of R programming language and we discussed each example as well. And at the end we had an example of data sciences and how to implement it in R programming language. And prior to that we also learned that how we can download and include different packages in our package repository. So please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. If you have something to ask, please leave a comment below. We will see you in another video. Till then, take care.